What happens when you pair one of the fastest GPUs in the world with a CPU older than the iPhone 1? Today, we're gonna find out because I bought an RTX 4080, a $1,000 monster graphics card, and decided to use it with a processor from 2005. At first, this might sound like an easy task, just drop the GPU into the motherboard and call it a day. But this turned out to be the hardest, riskiest challenge I've ever attempted. I had to use two power supplies, a paperclip, and I even broke a few things on the way. And by the end of it, this became the most expensive video I've ever made. The very first step in this challenge was obviously to find an RTX 4080, but getting one at a decent price quickly turned from a simple task into the riskiest transaction I've made in my life. And at one point, I was 100% convinced I got scammed. On average, it cost about $1,000 on the used market, but with tax and shipping, that can easily go up to 1100 bucks, which is more than my entire PC. So to avoid these extra fees, I started digging through Kijiji, a local marketplace specifically for Canadians. And after literal days, I finally found one. An RTX 4080, barely used, and the guy just wanted 1300 Canadian, or 958 US dollars. Still a lot of money, but it ended up being the cheapest 4080 I could find. For context, to find a deal equally as good on eBay, I'd have to buy it for $837 before tax and including shipping. But there's just one problem. The seller lives over 100 kilometers away from me, and I don't have a car. Meaning that the only way I could get this card was to trust a complete stranger to ship me a $1,000 GPU with zero buyer protection. No sane person would have gone through with this, but I did it anyway because I had to know if this would actually work. But let's just say things didn't necessarily go as planned. The next day, he made it to the post office on time, so I gave him my shipping info and sent a deposit to cover the shipping. Once he showed me the shipping receipt next to the box, I sent over the rest of the $1,300. However, this is where things went south. He said that he didn't get the payment. With a crop screenshot like this, I had no choice but to assume that he was intentionally hiding something. And to make things just that little bit scarier, I could no longer access my messages for some reason. What an elaborate way to scam me because I can't report him if I don't have access to the chat logs. Luckily, this was only an issue with the app and we continued talking on the website instead. What a crazy coincidence. But then I realized that after sending the money, I didn't get an email confirmation, which I'm supposed to get the moment I send funds. After a quick Google search, I found out that my shitty bank takes up to 30 minutes to process payments larger than a certain amount. So I let him know that the payment was still processing, and from here I could only trust him because I already sent the money. Again, technically he did show me the receipt for the shipment, but it's not hard to just get a refund for the shipping and take the GPU back. What I didn't realize is that the post office closes at 5. So if this payment doesn't go through in the next 30 minutes, we don't have time for another attempt and we would have to wait for another day. But luckily at 4.38 p.m. the payment finally went through and three days later I finally received the GPU I spent almost a thousand dollars on. Let's just hope it works. Once the graphics card was taken care of, it was time to find a 20 year old CPU to go with it. And what I ended up with was perfect. Now because this CPU is 20 years old, you would probably expect it to be trash. And it absolutely is. This is AMD's Athlon 64 I Ain't Reading All That 2 core processor from 2005. One of the first dual core processors while most CPUs at the time still only had one core. But that's about it for the positives. How about we take a look at the negatives? That said, you might have noticed I'm using the AM2 version of this chip, which technically came out a year later. So it's turning 19 this year, not quite 20. If you think this is cheating, don't worry because both versions of this CPU have the same core count, thread count, clock speed, and they perform exactly the same. The only difference is that this one supports DDR2 RAM instead of DDR1, which by the way is still incredibly slow by today's standards. And if the performance issues weren't bad enough, the physical side isn't much better. As you can clearly see, this old PC case was not designed for modern triple fan GPUs. As a result, we will be removing the motherboard to run the system open air. Sounds simple enough, but it was easier said than done. Despite having unscrewed every screw on the motherboard, I still can't remove it because of the fan and the wires getting in the way. The fan was relatively easy to unscrew, still harder than usual since this thing hasn't been unscrewed for the past 20 years. But it was nothing compared to removing these wires. Every single wire felt like it was super glued to the port. And when it came down to the very last one, I had PTSD from the last time I had to deal with these motherboard pins. Ow, ow. Oh, sh this one wire took three whole minutes to get out. And just as I thought things were going smoothly, this happened. This is very bad. But to be fair, this thing is literally 20 years old. It's not my fault, I swear. 
Okay, you know what? It might be my fault. With the main board finally out of the case, it's time to put everything back together and add in the GPU upgrade. So I reconnected every cable from the power supply back into the motherboard, reconnected my SSD, and plugged in the power supply into the wall. Now for the moment of truth, seeing if my PC or whatever's left of it can still turn on. And with the magic of my screwdriver, it looks like everything still functions as normal. However, when it came time to put the GPU into my 20 year old PC's motherboard, I ran into an issue that I never expected to see. If you take a look, there's enough space on this side for the IO shield, but over here, the backplate hits these RAM retention clips. Not even the 6900 XT or this tiny two fan RX 580 could fit in here either. Now I'm regretting not checking the compatibility before I made this huge commitment to the challenge. But maybe this was a good thing, because at this point, there's no turning back. I was forced to make this work no matter what. Now I'll be honest, this wasn't something I had to deal with in the past, so I wasn't sure what I should do here apart from giving up on the challenge, which I already decided was not a choice. So I came up with three different ways to fix this problem. Option one was to break off all four clips. Obviously, I didn't want to do this because I already broke so much shit and I'd probably break them by accident anyways. On top of that, if you break them off, it opens up lots of opportunities for system instability, er errors, and performance issues if you accidentally move your motherboard. I don't know about you, but that Loki doesn't sound very cool. So that leads us into the second option, buying a GPU riser. So instead of hurting my motherboard, I am hurting my pockets. In the past, I had absolutely no reason to buy a riser, because the only reason to get a riser is for mounting your GPU sideways to kill your airflow and heat up your PC. I don't see why you would ever do this unless you live in Antarctica or you spend more time looking at your PC than actually gaming. However, a riser is very useful in this case because this allows us to connect the GPU at a different point, instead of straight onto the motherboard. There are literally zero compromises to the solution apart from crippling debt. Yo, why do I owe 8 trillion dollars to Mr. Krabs? While waiting for the riser cable to arrive, I figured I'd use the time to speed up this 20 year old computer. Of course the 4080 is going to be bottlenecked no matter what, but if we can squeeze out just a little more performance, it might actually be usable. As much as I've been shitting on the CPU, what caught me off guard was just how much the RAM was holding everything back. Although I previously maxed out the memory, it doesn't really matter if it's still only 4 gigs of DDR2. That might not sound like a huge problem, but with just Task Manager open, the system was using 62% of its memory. Nearly two thirds of our memory is gone, and I have yet to open a game. It was at this moment I knew there was no way I could keep running Windows 10. So I did what I should have done from the start. I installed something lighter, an OS that wouldn't eat half the RAM just by existing. Normally, I wouldn't install custom OS because the benefits are generally very minimal and aren't worth the hassle. But since the system is so far below what I'd consider to be low end, Tiny10 was able to drop the CPU and RAM usage significantly, and the system instantly felt more responsive. Don't get me wrong, it's still absolute ass cheeks, but at least it's somewhat usable. The next day, the riser cable arrived. After a bit of tweaking to get everything to sit properly, I was finally able to slot in the RTX 4080. Only issue, I had no way to power it up. The system's original 300 watt PSU isn't even close to being strong enough, so I pulled the power supply from my main PC. It's the MSI 850GL, a modular PSU capable of powering high-end GPUs such as the 4080. Having both PSUs plugged in, the CPU fan spins up and the GPU's light turns on, but there is still no display. Seeing that everything looks about right in terms of power delivery, I thought this had to be a BIOS issue. So I tried getting into the BIOS without the 4080 to see if there was a fix, but I couldn't get into the BIOS anymore. Did I just fry the motherboard? No way, bruh. In a last ditch effort, I pulled out what? I pulled the CMOS battery out to reset my BIOS settings and tried another GPU to see if that would work. I have a spare 1080 Ti lying around so I plugged that one in and to my surprise the lights near the two power connectors lit up, which typically means that there is a power delivery issue. Little did I know, despite the power supply being switched on, it ironically wasn't supplying any power. Faced with the problem, I had to figure out how to turn it on, something that was never an issue with older power supplies. After a bit of searching, I found this YouTube short that said I needed to bend a paper paper clip in a certain way and connect the green and black wires together, essentially tricking the PSU into turning on. Unfortunately, my cable is all black, so I had no clue which was which. How am I supposed to tell which one's the green one? I couldn't find any info on this online, so I said f*** it and tried every single one until it worked. 
Finally, the GPU turns on, but despite all my efforts and everything else looking to be completely fine, it still wouldn't post because the 4080 doesn't have legacy BIOS support. By this point, I had a choice. Either I abandon the whole project, or I find a solution that stayed true to the original challenge. That's when I brought in the RTX 4000 ADA. Released six months after the 4080, it uses the same ADA architecture, and has the same base GPU die as the original 12GB version of the 4080, which we now know as the 4070Ti. It's the closest thing to a 4080 that I own, and still works on a legacy BIOS system. More importantly, it makes zero difference in this scenario, because we're bottlenecked so hard by the 20 year old CPU that we're gonna get the same results even at 4K resolution. With our 4080 replacement up and running, we're gonna put this PC to the test in a few different AAA games at 4K, starting with the lightest one of the bunch, Tomb Raider Anniversary from 2007. It's an 18 year old AAA title, and if this build can't handle a game this old, it's not going to stand a chance against the next games we're gonna try. Unsurprisingly, it ran amazingly well in 4K, averaging above 90 FPS. Plenty smooth for a 3D platformer. But yeah, not exactly impressive when the game is as old as the CPU itself. Next up is Tomb Raider 2013. Not only is this a huge 6 year jump from the last game, but this was one of the most demanding games of 2013, which will prove to be a difficult game for this CPU to run. Cranking it up to 4K actually gave us pretty solid results running at almost 50 FPS. It's not the easiest game to run at 4K, and it's certainly a solid result coming from a CPU that's almost 20 years old. On the other hand, the sequel to this game, Rise of the Tomb Raider from 2015, was a terrible experience. It opens the launcher, but won't get past this loading screen. I sat here waiting for about 10 minutes until I decided to move on. The third game in the trilogy, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, was somehow even worse. It froze on the splash screen and refused to move. And finally, Fortnite, which I play multiple times a week live on Twitch, so be sure to follow me there. There, we're almost at 400 followers. But yeah, Fortnite doesn't work because the Epic Games Launcher actually gives me an error. Not sure what's up with that, but we straight up can't even download the game. And so, pairing an RTX 4080 with a 20 year old CPU went about as well as you'd expect. From the nice surprises like Tomb Raider 2013 at 4K, to completely freezing on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, this was one of the most ridiculous setups I've ever tested. And I learned a ton along the way. But if you thought this was crazy, wait until you see how I built the fastest possible $100 budget PC for competitive games. Click here to watch Watch that next.